Hello and welcome to the uh, Commercial Building Energy Standards presentation. My name is Matt Kilcoyne and I am a program manager with Efficiency Vermont. Um, Efficiency Vermont is uh, presenting on the Commercial Building Energy Standards on behalf of the Energy Code Assistance Center today. Uh, for those of you who are joining us live, please keep yourself muted. And if you need to unmute during the presentation to ask a question, uh, just click on the microphone icon and that will unmute you. And you can um, either ask your question uh, that way or type a question into the online chat. Uh, to earn EEN credits, please type your name into the online chat as well. Presenting today is my colleague Charlie Carpenter. Charlie is an energy consultant with Efficiency Vermont who works primarily on commercial new construction projects. He leads a team of engineers uh, to interpret the adopted energy code language and will continue to be a resource for code inquiry assistance. Charlie is the departing president of the Champlain Valley chapter of ASHRAE and is still active on the board. Um, again, if there are any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, otherwise, please keep yourself muted throughout the presentation or you can also type them into the online chat and I will be monitoring it. Uh, thank you so much and turning it over to you, Charlie. All right, thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, hope everyone's doing well today. I am going to dive right into it. We've got a lot of material to cover on the uh, 2020 Commercial Building Energy Standards, also known as the CBs. So the agenda today uh, is broken out uh, based on the chapters of the new code. Um, as you can see here, there's a lot of different uh, systems involved in the building that we're going to cover today. So the first chapter um, is the scope and administration. So first off, I want to state that uh, the effective date for both the RBs and CBs, which is the residential code and the commercial building codes, um, will be effective on September 1st of this year, 2020. Um, I will only be speaking to the CBs in this presentation, but I wanted to um, make this um, make everyone aware of this. And for residential projects, any project with a construction start date after September 1st of this year must comply with their updated um, RBs. And construction start is when um, the ground was first dug to uh, prepare for a foundation or slab. On the other hand, the commercial um, industrial projects for the CBs will, um, if you have applied for and obtained a permit before September, first of 2020, you can still follow the requirements of the existing 2015 commercial building energy standards. Um, if you do not obtain your permit until after September 1st, then you would need to comply with the updated CBs. Another administrative um, slide is dependent on when a building would be residential or commercial. So, um, and this is for mixed use buildings that have both residential and commercial um, mixed into the building. So any building that is three stories in height or less will be residential for any of the living spaces and spaces only serving those residents like hallways, laundry, community rooms, and storage rooms and the commercial code would apply to areas that are serving both the commercial and uh, residential users of the building. Any building that is four stories or more in height, then the, all of the CB's um, requirements will apply. There is a new exemption in the code. Um, this is There are multiple others listed that are the same as the 2015 CBs, but the new one is yurt and tent buildings, which we used to get questions about every so often. Um, they are only exempt from the commercial energy code if there is no mechanical cooling and if they are heated with biomass or on-site renewable energy. Otherwise, they must comply with the energy code. The second chapter of the code has some, uh, I've got some new useful definitions in here. 
um, that will be relevant for the rest of the presentation. The first is code official. Um, this is called out as um, the, the, the person who has the role of administering and enforcing the commercial building energy standards. Um, unfortunately, this is not described in any more detail other than the fact that the Vermont Department of Public Service does not enforce the code and neither does Efficiency Vermont. Uh, there's potential for um, refinement to this definition once we get the final code language of the 2020 CBs, hopefully in the next month or so. I do want to reiterate that uh, this presentation is based on information um, signed into legislation back in December of 2019. And that um, that information has then gone through the Department of Public Service and to the International Code Council, who is drafting the final version of this code. And once that is available um, to Efficiency Vermont and everyone else, I will be going through these slides and um, just double checking on the, the final language to make sure it's um, all equal. Another useful definition for um, this presentation is a cold climate heat pump. They are air sourced. They have a variable inverter driven, uh, variable capacity inverter driven compressor. Um, they must be able to heat uh, at full capacity down to five degrees outdoor air temperature. And at that temperature have a minimum coefficient of performance of 1.75. And these cold climate heat pumps must be matched to an, uh, an indoor unit that has been AHRI rated to the outdoor unit to prove that coefficient of performance at five degrees. High efficacy lamps and fixtures. Um, lamps must be um, either CFLs, LEDs, T8s, or other fluorescent fixtures, and must be 65 lumens per watt or more. Any high efficacy fixture would be one that is 55 lumens per watt or more. Uh, another new definition is for a multifamily dwelling. It is a building with three or more dwelling units that are permanent occupants and the units are aligned either vertically or horizontally. And if the units are side by side, one of these three statements must be true to be a multifamily dwelling. There shall be no wall extending from the ground level all the way to the roof. They could have a shared heating system or they could have a shared water supply or sewage system. If one of those is met, it would be a multifamily dwelling. There are some building occupancy classifications that come into play in this code. Um, the, I'll go through all of them here and mention them later on. First is group A, which is an assembly type building occupancy which is then broken out further where you've got performing arts, um, restaurants, cafeterias, courtrooms, uh, and sporting, um, sporting venues. You've got group B, which are business buildings, which is primarily offices. Group E is educational type buildings, which is K through 12, does not include colleges. Um, going on more, we've got Group F, which is factories. Group H, high hazard buildings. Group I, institutional buildings. So that would be um, some colleges in there. Group M, mercantile. So that's uh, shopping sort of areas. Group S, non-hazardous storage buildings. And then we've got group R, which are residential type commercial buildings broken out into R1, hotels and motels, R2, apartments, dorms, fraternities, sororities. I'll skip down to R4, which is uh, nursing homes, supervised residential care, and R3 is anything not listed in uh, R1, 2, or 4. Another definition is on-site renewable energy, and that's energy generation located on the project site itself, and it can be one of or a combination of any of these um, 
these sources here, solar, wind, waves, tides, landfill gas, biogas, biomass, or heat from within the earth. A semi-conditioned space is new for this version of the code. So this is a space within a building that is directly or indirectly heated and cooled, indirectly heated or cooled, and has a heating output of less than or equal to 14 BTU per hour per square foot of floor area, and would have a cooling sensible output of less than 3.4 BTU per hour per square foot of floor area. And um, my thought is that warehouses and storage areas that are not um, either not cooled and or not heated to very high temperatures may fall into this category. And I will um, show where this comes into play later on, typically for the building envelope. Okay, chapter three are some general requirements of the code. And this is just one slide. Uh, what's in here is what the design climate parameters are for the state of Vermont. So when designing um, mechanical systems um, and envelope systems for Vermont, all of Vermont is within climate zone 6A. There are some updated design conditions in this version of the code. The, um, the heating temperature has increased slightly from minus 11 um, Fahrenheit to minus nine. Um, the cooling, I believe, is slightly updated, or it could be the same, where it's uh, 84 degree dry bulb and 69 degree wet bulb outdoors, and the heating degree days and cooling degree days are just slightly lower in this version of the code than in the previous version. Uh, there's no change to the indoor uh, design temps for calculating your uh, your heat, heating and cooling loads. Those are 72 maximum heating and 75 minimum cooling. Okay, now on to chapter four, the meat of the code. So first we've got some general requirements. There are two compliance paths that you can follow um, to show compliance with the commercial building energy code. The first is following all the requirements in sections C402 through 407 of the um, energy code, which I will go into in depth here. Uh, the second way is to follow ASHRAE 90.1 2016, um, plus applicable provisions in section C401.2.1, and also section C406, which is um, some additions that need to be put on top of ASHRAE 90.1 2016. And these are the same options as in the current 2015 energy code, except that was using the um, previous version of ASHRAE 90.1 2013. So that has been updated to ASHRAE 90.1 2016 for the 2020 code. All right, moving on to building envelope requirements, section C402. This is an overview of the changes. Um, there were the new definitions that I mentioned, multifamily and semi-conditioned spaces. There have been updated U-factor and R-value tables, uh, some new U-factor tables for uh, wood-framed attic assemblies, metal and wood-framed wall assemblies that are going to be quite useful. There's some fenestration um, window and skylight requirements that have been updated. Uh, air leakage requirements that have been um, updated and some slight changes to vestibules. So starting with the roofs, um, what was changed here is um, the U factors for uh, the different framing types, metal, attic, and insulation above deck are all a uh, closer match now. And again, so there are um, categories for a condition space, which is just a typical um, typical buildings that are heated and cooled to human comfort. And then you've got semi-conditioned, which must meet those requirements that I mentioned earlier for uh, low heating and cooling loads. And 
to the right here, we've got examples of what our values would um, meet those requirements for the different insulation values. And the semi-condition spaces are all um, less than the condition spaces. Uh, going into this a little more, so comparing this to what the 2015 code had, uh, we've got 2015 on the left and the 2020 requirements on the right. Um, there was no change in the attic insulation. You've got R49 for both 2015 and 2020. And, but then the uh, above deck insulation has increased from R30 continuous to R40 continuous and a metal building roof um, has added an extra layer of R11 um, within the purlins. This is uh, a table located within the code, which shows different um, assemblies that you can do to meet um, meet the code requirements. Uh, based on up at the top here, you've got continuous R value of insulation that you're putting on top of the roof. Um, you've got different ways of doing um, things on the left, like a single layer, double layer, linear system. Um, and I will note that the um, the gray areas are um, for the semi-conditioned spaces, anything in gray should meet the semi-conditioned requirements. And then anything that is uh, white will meet the standard code requirements. So if you're looking to do something that's not listed in the um, general R value um, requirements, you can use this table to um, find different um, ways of meeting the code, um, which is very helpful. Uh, similar, so this is a new assembly U factor table that was not in the old version of the code. This is for attics, uh, attic roofs with wood joists. So um, again, you've got you've got different um, ways to frame the attic: standard framing, advanced framing, and single rafter roofs um, with joists. Again, you've got gray areas meet the semi-conditioned requirements, and the white ones meet the standard code requirements. Um, for the roof assembly, when you are using continuous insulation, you must use at least two layers of um, insulation board with uh, staggered edges. Um, you must have a minimum of R12 over the entire deck. Um, and the area weighted average R value must be equal to what was listed in those um, previous tables. So if you need to go below the required required um, value in some areas, you need to go above that in others to make the area weighted average equal to uh, the requirements in the table. For tapered insulation at roof and uh, also roof drains, um, you must have at least 60% of the R value um, mentioned in that uh, the table that I showed earlier. And mechanical curbs um, must have at least R12 insulation. Skylight curbs um, can be the lesser amount of either R10 or the amount of insulation that is um, above the entire deck uh, to match up with that. So whichever is less, you can choose. Walls above grade um, in 2020. So Overall, there are lower U values uh, throughout this than the old version. Um, and again, the U factors have been um, changed to match each framing type uh, more closely than the old code. So whether you've got wood frame, metal framed, metal buildings, or mass walls, all the U factors are uh, pretty close to each other. And then over here, we've got example assembly R values that you could use to reach those U values um, for the different walls, the framing types for both conditioned and semi-conditioned. So how this has changed from uh, 2015, as I mentioned, it's higher insulation values for 2020 than it was for 2015. So if you're comparing some example R values, um, a mass wall has gone from R13.3 continuous to R19 continuous. 
Um, metal buildings have increased somewhat. Um, all of them have across the board. Wood framed walls, um, you could have done R15 continuous in 2015. Now uh, R20 continuous will be required for condition spaces. This is a, another useful table in there for the assembly U factors of metal buildings, similar to the other tables we looked at where you've got continuous insulation on the top, uh, different amounts, and then different um, ways to insulate the walls for a metal building. Um, continuous single compression layer, um, cavity insulation, double layers, and you can uh, plug your numbers into this and see where you come out. Um, Again, gray is semi-conditioned and white is conditioned spaces. Uh, a new table that was not available in the old uh, code, which will be useful, is for metal framed buildings. So here you've got uh, the different steel framing um, at different um, depths, 3.5 inches and 6 inches, and also 16 inches on center and 24 inches on center. So this includes the effective uh, or shows the effective U factor, including the steel framing and insulation. And one more time, another new uh, table for this code is for the um, wood framed walls, similar, similar to the previous one where you've got different wood stud sizes, uh, you know, 3.5, 5.5 and 10 inch <clears throat> studs at either 16 inches or 24 inches on center, and your continuous insulation up at the top. So below grade walls, um, the big change is that um, these have increased over the old version of the code, and the semi-conditioned standard um, requirement is about half of what the conditioned requirements are. So if I go to a comparison of 2015, uh, what you can see is that a condition below grade wall used to need R10 continuous in 2015. In 2020, it will need R15 continuous. And for a semi-conditioned space, it would only be 7.5, R7.5 continuous. Floors. Um, these are the new value u values and example r values for floors in a building um, what i will note is that um, for the 2020 code <clears throat> for both heated and unheated slabs you will need insulation under the entire slab um, r10 for unheated and r20 for a heated slab the previous version of the code did not require insulation under the entire slab. So I'll show that again here um, with the 2015 versus the 2020 slides or um, codes where in 2015 you needed only R10 for 48 inches around the perimeter of the slab or down to the foundation and now it's under the entire slab. Fenestration requirements. So these are windows and skylights, anything that you can see through in the building. The U factors have decreased slightly, and uh, there's been no change in the window solar heat gate co solar heat gain coefficients. Um, Semi-conditioned spaces are exempt from the uh, solar heat gain coefficient requirements. So. Um, in 2015, a fixed window had needed to have a U-factor of 0.36. Now it's 0.29. An operable window was 0.43, and now will be 0.37. Uh, an, an entrance door was 0.77, and will now require 0.68. And um, skylights have decreased, have uh, increased slightly from 0.5 to 0.48, and their solar heat gain coefficient changed slightly hey charlie yep this is cheryl um hi cheryl do you, do you hi do you know um i i haven't looked at windows in a long time do you know if windows um with this u factor are red, are pretty readily available 
I mean, I assume they are, but I, I believe so. I haven't okay. um, really dove into the details yet, but yes, I okay. I believe I've seen fixed inoperable windows well okay. within these windows. Okay. I mean, that, that makes, that that makes sense to me. Yeah. 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 All right. Yep. Thanks for the question. Uh, one of the, so another change to the code is for air barriers. There will now be blower door testing required on all new buildings and additions uh, within the commercial energy code. And there are two ways to comply with this. You can either do performance testing where you just uh, do a blower door test and hit a specific number, or you can do full air barrier commissioning where you don't need to hit a specific blower door number uh, to pass, but there's many, many steps to follow, which is likely going to be a longer process than just testing and um, hitting a performance number. So if you're doing performance testing of the air barrier, uh, you need to meet or exceed um, 0 0.30 CFM 75 per square foot. The previous version of the code was 0.5 CFM 50 per square foot. So the changes to this are the lower air infiltration rate, the fact that um, the test is now being needs to be done at 75 pascals of depressurization instead of 50. And it is uh, a six sided surface area calculation as opposed to five sides in the previous code. So now the slab and below grade walls will be included in the um, in the testing, in the calculation of the surface area. Uh, there's a couple exceptions to this. If you've got a large building, 50,000 square feet or more, you don't need to test the entire building. You can test a portion of the building, but you must do the top level that is underneath the roof. Um, any entrances or any level that's on has entrance and loading docks and you must uh, test about 25% of the wall area and pass those requirements. Um, if you test a building or portion of the building and the results are greater than 0.3 CFM 75, but less than 0.4 CFM 75, you need to find the leaks while the building is depressurized, depressurized and um, seal uh, with that you know, seal the best you can. You don't need to deconstruct anything. Um, and you need to document what was done in the in a report and send that to the owner. Um, it's not saying you need to test again and then exceed 0.3, but you need to, um, there's some details in there about what you need to do to, to fix the leaks that you find. Uh, if you choose to do continuous air barrier commissioning, commissioning um, the commissioning report must include a field inspection checklist um, that you perform during installation. You've got a um, construction report, which includes material handling and storage, um, what approved materials are, how to um, prepare surfaces for the air barrier, um, and uh, air barrier, you know, at all penetrations, how to make sure the air barrier stays continuous. This is uh, what the checklist looks like. So I'm not gonna go through all the details, but uh, I just wanted to put a, a snapshot of that in here. Another new addition to this code is uh, air infiltration of individual dwelling units. So if you've got dwelling units in your commercial building, this could be um, hotels, motels, or um, some larger multifamily buildings. You need to test a random sampling of units, um, about 10% in each building. Uh, you need to do at least one corner unit, one unit per floor, and about equal number of units per floor. So each dwelling unit must meet um, 0 .3, 0 0.35 CFM, 75 per square foot. And again, this is doing um, 75 pascals depressurization and using all six um, sides of the dwelling unit for the surface area. And you also just want to test each dwelling unit individually without adjacent units being tested at the same time. Um, 
each dwelling unit must uh, pass the test. And so as as opposed to the full building report. So if a failure occurs testing a dwelling unit, uh, the cause must be diagnosed and corrected and you must retest the unit until it passes and keep finding the issues and correcting them uh, until each unit passes. Uh, the construction contractor will not be the one who chooses the units to be tested. That will be um, more on a random, uh, more random, um, meeting the requirements for number of units per floor. And the HVAC, HVAC systems will be shut off during the test, but dampers for exhaust, air intake, and makeup air units will not be sealed up with um, plastic wrap. Uh, Charlie? Yep. So if the construction contractor isn't choosing the units, what does that mean? I mean, is the owner choosing them? Is is the I think how, how, do, how do we know that the construction contractor isn't choosing them? If, I uh, mean, whoever's performing the blower door test will. OK, so 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 they'll be sort of like a commissioning agent where it's like it's up to them to be impartial and and yes. not be swayed by the. Yeah, OK, yep, OK, I'd say so. Yeah, it's not like you want to show up and say, OK, these are all the units that you will be testing today. Right. Gotcha. OK, thanks. That's how I read the language. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, all right, the last slide I have for um, the envelope are vestibules. Um, there's There needs to be seven feet between the inside and outside doors of a vestibule. Um, they need to be heated to a maximum of 55 degrees. I believe they cannot be cooled. Um, and if they're unconditioned vestibules, not heated or cooled at all, you need to bring uh, either the interior or exterior wall of that vestibule up to the um, envelope requirements of the energy code. A um, couple new exceptions to requiring requiring vestibules are doors that open up to semi-conditioned spaces. They do not need a vestibule. Um, elevator doors in parking garages, so long as there are enclosed lobby doors for the elevator at each level, or um, vehicle doors to buildings do not need vestibules. So that's all I had for the envelope. If there are any questions, I'll move on to the mechanical systems. All right, section C403, building mechanical systems. This is an overview of some of the changes. Um, there, there's an electric resistance backup heating um, called out for cold climate heat pumps. Equipment performance increases, um, energy recovery system um, updates, economizer updates, parking garage ventilation, VFDs on fans, and some refrigeration system um, changes. So for ventilation, uh, you must follow requirements of ASHRAE standard 62.1 uh, version 2016. That is the ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality standard. The 2015 version of the commercial energy code used the same standard, but the 2013 version. So this has been updated to 2016 for the 2020 commercial energy code. Uh, part of this change is in switching those is that mechanical ventilation is now required on all new buildings. Uh, natural ventilation is not allowed um, in ASHRAE standard 62.1 2016. Electric, resisti electric resistance heating allowance. So electric resistance heating, uh, primarily for a building, is still prohibited. There are two exceptions to that, and those are uh, for backup heating in uh, the first case, a multifamily building where uh, the heat loads are quite low, um, six BTU per hour per square foot or less at design temperature. If that is met, then electric resistance can be used um, for backup heating. For cold climate heat pumps, uh, as I mentioned in the definition earlier of what that is, um, full heating load must be met by the heat pump at five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the envelope must be air tested to an even lower number of 0.2 CFM uh, 75 per square foot. The Again, the normal code value for the 2020 
code is 0.3. So it's a bit tighter. Uh, again, that's 75 pascals and six sided. Um, there's a little asterisk here for uh, these two. Um, Burling if these projects are in Burlington, Burlington uh, uh, Electric Department needs to approve these projects before they can be using electric resistance uh, backup heating. Uh, commissioning and equipment sizing. Um, mechanical systems need to be commissioned in accordance with Section C407, which I will go into details uh, later on. Uh, that includes a commissioning plan, um, system adjusting and balancing, performance testing, uh, commissioning report, and some documentation. Um, there's a note in here that uh, equipment sizing, um, si equipment can only be oversized 10% this code. Uh, the HVAC equipment performances have changed only slightly compared to the 2015 code. So um, these are all the tables that you typically see in the code uh, stating all the heating and cooling efficiencies. Um, AC and condensing units, there's been no changes from the 2015 code. Uh, heat pumps, there was a small increase in the uh, seasonal heating performance factor in the smallest of heat pumps. Water chilling packages, um, no change from the 2015 code. For VRF systems, um, if they're air cooled, the heating and cooling efficiencies are slightly higher. Water source VRFs on and IEER uh, seasonal efficiency has been added and ground water and ground source uh, VRFs are the same um, same efficiencies as 2015. Part load controls, um, any hydronic systems um, that are greater than 300,000 BTU per hour shall include supply water temperature adjustments of both the heating and cooling um, water supply, and you must reset those at least 25%. Um, the old limit for systems uh, in the previous code was 500,000 BTU per hour, so that has now been reduced. You must vary pump flow for any uh, pump two horsepower or more, um, and you must do a f at least a 50% flow reduction. And the old um, the previous code had that requirement for pumps five horsepower or greater. So that horsepower rating has been reduced for the 2020 code. Um, this is not part of the code, but I think it's useful. It's describing what a fan system is. Um, there are, um, this definition is useful for uh, when you're talking about economizers and energy recovery systems. So the fan system is um, the group or, uh, or where the actual heating and cooling source is coming from in the HVAC system. So for small single zone systems like VRF, um, water source heat pump, fan coil unit, um, though the fan system is the actual indoor unit because that's where um, the air or liquid, whatever the, the heat transfer um, material is, is actually being heated or cooled. Um, similarly, similarly, just a small rooftop unit is the same. Uh, if you've got larger multi-zone units, um, the fan system is actually going to be, say, up in a large rooftop unit or air handler up on the roof, because that's where um, the heating and cooling coils are that are heating up um, the air that are that's then being distributed throughout the building. Some uh, so requirements for economizers, uh, they're required on chilled water systems with capacities um, after you subtract the economizer capacity less than uh, 1,320,000 BTU per hour for water cooled and 1,720,000 BTU per hour for air cooled or district systems. Um, fan systems with cooling capacities greater than or equal to 54,000 BTU per hour um, need to have economizers. Um, 
other than group R occupancies, if the building is a group R residential occupancy, uh, the fan system needs to be over 270,000 BTU per hour. Uh, the number of exceptions for econ um, needing economizers has been reduced. Um, now it's down to spaces that need to be humidified above 35 um, Fahrenheit dew point, systems operating less than 20 hours a week, and systems that include heat recovery do not need to have economizers. Economizer controls. Um, you need to be able to do partial economizing with integrated mechanical cooling um, so that you can have the outdoor air damper open 100% down to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, direct expansion units are required to have at least three stages of cooling if they're greater than 75,000 BTU per hour and at least four stages of cooling if they're greater than 240,000 BTU per hour. Um, if you have one uh, constant compressor, uh, constant capacity compressor, and a variable displacement compressor, uh, you can use that in lieu of the different stages of cooling, where the variable compressor will uh, modulate the uh, the capacity. The high limit shutoff for an economizer has been decreased from 70 down, 75 down to 70 degrees, so that increases the amount of uh, time that they can be um, they can be used and there need to be fault detection diagnostics included in the economizer controls. Demand control ventilation. Um, this is similar to what was um, required in the 2015 energy code. You need to have CO2 based demand control ventilation in areas that are larger than 500 square feet and that have an occupant load of 25 people per 1,000 square feet and uh, that have one of the following systems, either an air side economizer, um, auto modulation of the outdoor air damper, or uh, systems that, or um, these spaces that have 3,000 CFM of outdoor air design flow. And there are exceptions to needing demand control ventilation in a space if that space has energy recovery included, if there's no um, DDC controls in that controlling that space, um, if the makeup air, if the sorry, if the supply air um, subtracted from the makeup air is less than 1,200 CFM, you don't need demand control ventilation, or if it is um, process only ventilation, it's not required. Parking garage ventilation. Um, this is a new call out in the code. Um, an enclosed parking garage is a garage that has uh, between zero and 40% um, permanent openings within it. Um, the code states that you must follow the Vermont Fire and Building Safety Code ventilation rates, which state that um, you need to have a continuous ventilation rate of 0 0.05 CFM per square foot of garage area and the HVAC, the ventilation system must be able to reach 0.75 CFM per square foot at design rate. And you need to have uh, carbon monoxide sensors throughout the garage that will sense the levels of, of CO and stage or modulate the airflow between um, between those continue the continuous rate and the design flow rate um, throughout the parking garage. Energy recovery systems. So in the code, the language has changed from calling out fan systems to air systems. So um, that is something to keep in mind. Um, as I described what the fan system definition was earlier, that um, may no longer apply to energy recovery systems. <clears throat> the um, energy recovery effectiveness is the same at 50% as it was in the previous code. Um, there are a lot of a lot of the same exceptions, like spaces that are heated um, to a maximum of 60 degrees, do not need energy recovery. Systems operating less than 20 hours a week 
Uh, if you're exhausting toxic or flammable fumes or dust, you do not need it. Um, kitchen hoods that are removing um, heavily grease laden uh, air do not need energy recovery systems. And there's a new exception in here for um, if 60% of the outdoor heating energy is provided from site recovered energy, you do not need energy recovery systems. Uh, this is so energy recovery systems are required for air systems operating 3000 hours or more per year. This is a table uh, from the code that has been updated for 2020. Um, it's always been a little bit confusing to go through it, so I'll try to go through an example right now to see if that helps. My example is if you have um, a rooftop unit that has 10,000 CFM of supply air, it operates 4,000 hours a year, which is more than the required 3,000. Um, this rooftop unit has 3,000 CFM of outdoor air. What you would do is you find what the ratio or what the percentage of outdoor air to supply air is. So that's 3,000 compared to 10,000. So that's 30% outdoor air. <clears throat> so what you would do is at the top level of this table, find where 30% outdoor air is, and that's right here, greater than or equal to 30% and less than 40%. And if the, then you follow it down here, if the design supply airflow rate is greater than or equal to 5,500 CFM, energy recovery is required. And the design supply airflow for this rooftop unit is 10,000 CFM. So based on this, um, this rooftop unit would be required to have energy recovery since it is supplying more than 5,500 at design airflow. So hopefully that helps describe how you would use this table for your different um, mechanical systems. Kitchen exhaust demand control ventilation. Um, these are the same requirements that were in the 2015 energy code where um, kitchen exhaust systems greater than 5,000 CFM must um, do one of the following uh, to their exhaust air. Um, either 50% of the replacement air must be transfer air um, that otherwise would have been exhausted. You can do a demand control ventilation system. Um, you need to do that on 75% of the exhaust air and whatever you are um, doing the demand control ventilation on must have at least a 50% reduction in airflow. The third option is an energy recovery system that's UL listed. Um, that would be 40% effectiveness on at least 50% of the air that you are exhausting. Those are the same requirements as the 2015 code. Uh, question? Yep. Um, have you seen, and have you actually seen installed an energy recovery system on a kitchen hood? Uh, I have seen it mentioned on one project. Okay. Um, I, that's sort of it. it I think they're, okay. I, I don't know that much about them, to be honest. Um, yeah, because it, it, it's tricky to, you can't, yeah, it's really hard to do an air, I don't even know if they do air, you know, air recovery. I mean, if it's, I, I've seen them where they have to, they run pipes through them or something, because there's so much yeah. gunk in there. So yeah, I'm not sure how that, I don't know a lot about them. So I just Yeah, wondered. exactly, because there's a lot of grease in the air and things. It's, right. um, it's complicated. It's not okay. like a standard. Um, energy recovery system. Right. So okay. typically I've seen people do number two or you put a yeah. demand control ventilation system. Right. In. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Just curious. Thanks. Yep. Good question. Uh, fan airflow control. So when do airflows need to be varied? Um, the cooling system size where this is required has been reduced from 5.4 tons down to two tons. Um, and for direct expansion and chilled water units, you need to have two stages of fan control. The lowest speed must be at least uh, two thirds of the max speed and must also draw 40% um, of the maximum power. 
for those units. For any system that is non-direct expansion or chilled water, so anything else, you must have at least a 50% speed reduction. And um, at that reduced speed, it must be at least 30% power draw of full power. Uh, fan speed control, um, fan systems two horsepower or more need to have VFDs. The old limit um, or the limit in the old code was 7.5 horsepower. So this has been reduced to include more fan systems. Um, heat rejection devices need to reduce um, down to 50% of the design airflow or 30% of the design. 30% of the design fan wattage, um, one of those two. Walk-in coolers, freezers, and refrigerated warehouses. Um, all of the insulation values of those, um, those cooled boxes and buildings are the same as 2015. Um, the new requirements are on the lighting side. Uh, it says LED lighting is required in these spaces. Um, that are 90 lumens per watt or greater. Uh, controls are required on those LEDs that turn the lights off after 15 minutes of unoccupancy. There are some, uh, or there will be refrigeration efficiency tables um, for standalone equipment. Um, this has not yet been published. Um, it's gonna be in the final um, CB's language that should be coming out soon. It was not in uh, the adopted language that I was reviewing back in December. So, and to be just to not to clarify, but just to add something to this in the past, in the 2015 code, anything that was Energy Star rated met the requ met or exceeded the requirements here. Just yes. so, so I assume that that would be what it was going forward, but I don't know that for sure. Yes, I didn't want to make any assumptions, um, yeah. but I, I would think that anything Energy Star um, should meet these requirements. Yes. Yeah. OK. Yep. Thanks. Uh, a new system on refrigeration that's been added is on compressor systems. Um, it states that floating suction pressure control is required. Um, exceptions to that are single compressors that do not have variable capacity or um, certain suction groups with um, these three criteria, uh, design temp, 30 degrees or more, cascade systems, or serve chillers for secondary cooling. And, and to be clear also on this, suction pressure control is different from floating head pressure, so that doesn't, that doesn't negate our ability to claim savings and to offer incentives for floating head pressure control still going forward. This is a, a different type of control. Okay, great. Yeah. Yes, the, the language is a bit confusing. Yeah, I, I had to look into it and, and ask some questions. I wasn't sure either, so. Great. Uh, another requirement is for, um, you need to have liquid subcooling on 100,000 BTU per hour or greater systems. And crankcase heaters on compressors must cycle off um, when they are operating. Duct and piping insulation. Um, duct insulation are all the same levels as the 2015 commercial code. Pipe insulation um, is all the same, but is now required for all um, pipe fluid temperatures um, outside of 60 degree Fahrenheit and 85 degree Fahrenheit. Um, the old upper limit was 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So that has been brought down and insulation is required for um, cooler hot water temps. Snow and ice melt controls. Um, there is no more manual control allowed for snow and ice melt controls, only automatic. Um, you need to either have it shut off at 40 degree Fahrenheit outdoor air temperature or 50 degree Fahrenheit um, measured at two inches below uh, the slab or um, sidewalk, whatever the surface is that is being heated. And that was it for 
um, building mechanical systems. Any questions before I move on? Nope. All right, so the next section, uh, C404, is for service hot water heating, uh, also known as domestic hot water. Uh, electric water heaters. The maximum size of an electric water heater has increased to 7.5 uh, kilowatts. Uh, that's up from 5 kilowatts in the previous code. Uh, exceptions to this are instant electric water heaters that are serving emergency shower and eye wash stations can be larger than that. Um, and hybrid heat pumps have no KW limit if it meets all of these requirements. Um, at least 60% of the hot water demand can be met from just the heat pump portion of the water heater, not the electric um, resist resistance element. Uh, shower, uh, any shower heads in a facility with a heat pump water heater um, must be less than two gallons per minute, and all dishwashing equipment in a facility with heat pump water heater must be Energy Star rated. Uh, hot water equipment performance. There has been some new equipment added to the performance uh, tables. One is a tabletop, uh, three foot tall, cabinet sized heater uh, and grid enabled hot water heaters that must, uh, so there's performance requirements for those. They also must have a 75 gallon storage tank, um, at least tied to them, and they must have been manufactured after April 16th of 2015. Uh, heat pump water heater performance category has been added, and there's been slight increases in efficiencies for gas and oil storage heaters and instant gas heaters. I believe they might have jumped up just a couple percentage points. High input um, water heating systems, so any gas fired equipment. Um, must now meet 92% thermal efficiency. The old requirement was 90%. And if you have multiple equipment um, in your building for a lot of uh, hot water needs, the weighted average uh, per capacity of the water heaters must be 92% or greater. So you could have some equipment that's more, some that's less, but weighted average must be 92% or higher. Um, there's some exceptions to needing to meet that requirement. If at least 20% of the annual hot water comes from on-site renewables, your gas-fired um, equipment doesn't need to be 92% efficient. And individual dwelling unit heaters and other small heaters less than 100,000 BTU per hour are not included in the uh, total rating output of a high input water heating system. Those are um, just going to be included in the, the smaller individual sized unit requirements. Circulation pumps on hot water systems. They need to have either a time switch that turns the pumps off when there's no hot water required in the building or have modulating pumps uh, uh, that are set to a uh, minimum hot water temperature controlled via an aquastat on the pump return. And there are the, an exception to that is uh, healthcare facilities um, where Legionellis, um, in accordance with ASHRAE standard 188, um, could be a problem with turning down, um, turning down the pump speed um, circulating throughout the building. Maximum allowable pipe length. Um, these were sections in the previous code that have now been removed um, from the 2020 code as there was a lot of confusion and um, uh, confusion with them and it didn't, it made it a lot of really difficult to implement these when designing new buildings. Uh, hot water heating systems need to be commissioned in uh, accordance with section C407.2. Uh, those would be, so any hot water heating systems 
uh, for domestic hot water, swimming pool heaters, spa heaters, and any of the controls for those systems need to be commissioned. And I'll go into those details when I get to that section. So that was it for service water heating. I will move on unless there are any questions on that. So the next section is electrical power and lighting systems, section C405. Um, new lighting definition for this code is uh, LLC, which is luminaire level lighting controls. Um, so these are lighting systems with embedded lighting control logic, logic that includes occupancy sensors, um, ambient light level sensors, um, wireless networking, and um, uh, local override switching available. Dwelling and sleeping unit lighting um, needs to have 90% of the lamps and fixtures installed in a dwelling or sleeping unit shall be high efficacy. And again, I, what high efficacy means is for lamps, 65 lumens per watt or greater, and for fixtures, 55 lumens per watt or greater. Lighting controls, um, you can comply with um, two, two different ways to comply with the controls portion of this code. There's the standard lighting control sections that uh, I will go into detail on later, or you can install a um, LLC luminaire level lighting control um, to increase and decrease light output based on occupant activity and daylight availability. Exceptions to Needing lighting controls are exit and emergency lighting, um, the dwelling and sleeping units lighting, and industrial and manufacturing process areas where the production is occurring or there are safety concerns for um, turning on or off or dimming the lighting. Egress lighting, uh, there is a new um, portion of the code for occupancy controls on that. Um, egress lighting is lighting that is continuously on in the building. Egress lighting, um, so the requirement in this code is that there must be a 50% power reduction after 15 minutes of, um, <clears throat> of unoccupied time. And that was not in the old version of the code. Um, exceptions to needing to put occupancy controls on egress lighting is if um, the egress areas are uh, lit up to 50% or less of the lighting power density allowances that I'll go over later. If the um, egress lighting is less than 0 0.02 watts per square foot of the total building area, then you don't need controls. Uh, or if that lighting is required by the uh, National Fire Protection Association's codes, NFPA 1 or NFPA 101. Time switch controls, uh, these are the same requirements as in uh, the 2015 code. You need to have seven day and holiday schedules, um, backup uh, programmable in case the power goes out, a manual override for up to two hours in a space that is uh, no larger than 5,000 square feet per override switch. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions that have been added to where time switch controls are needed uh, listed here mall concourses auditoriums sale areas manufacturing areas and sports arenas there are others in there as well um, but those are the updated ones light reduction controls uh, again same requirement as the previous code you need to have um, manual control in spaces to reduce the light level at least 50%, if not more. Uh, exceptions to this are areas within a daylight zone that are going to be following the daylighting requirements of the code. Spaces that have only one fixture that is small, less than 50 watts. Spaces that are using, um, or that have installed less than 0.3 watts per square foot of lighting power. And corridors, equipment rooms, lobbies, and electrical and mechanical rooms do not need light reduction controls. 
daylight controls, uh, spaces with more than 150 watts within a daylight zone, whether that's from a window or a skylight, um, need to have daylight controls. Exceptions to that are healthcare facilities where there's patient care occurring, first floor of um, occupancy group A2 buildings, which is restaurants or um, group M mercantile shopping buildings do not need to have daylight controls. If the LPD, if the lighting power density is less than 35% of the maximum allowable watts per square foot, you don't need daylight controls. And if the total connected lighting power is less than the adjusted interior lighting power allowance, which is um, equation 4.8 that I will show next. So if you, um, if the adjusted lighting power allowance um, is equal, um, equals this formula here, which I won't go into detail on, where you take into account uh, daylight floor areas, um, the amount of area that's not in the daylight zone, um, then if you meet this equation, you do not need to do daylighting controls in a space. Daylight control function, um, so side and top light, so windows and skylights need to be controlled separately. You need to be able to calibrate um, the daylight uh, control functionality from within a space, um, just the facility staff, not the occupants. You have to be able to dim down to 15% 15, 15 total power output in offices, classrooms, labs, and libraries. Um, you must be able to have complete shutoff of the lights when there's enough uh, daylighting available. Each orientation of north, south, east, and west <clears throat> must have separate controls. Um, a three-minute time delay for the daylight um, levels uh, so that you prevent cycling. Each daylight sensor can control a maximum of 2,500 square feet, and you can have a manual override to dim switches um, or to only to reduce light levels in those spaces. You can't have manual override to increase it um, in daylight zones. Um, more daylight dimming control, um, automatic dimming, and it should be trying to maintain a uniform uh, illumination level throughout the space. And you can do that either with continuous dimming, um, again, down to 15% uh, of the max power and then turn off after that. Or you can do some sort of stepped dimming where you have at least two steps, uh, preferably more, um, where you're increasing in equal increments uh, rounded to the nearest 10% um, between zero and 100% power. But that's not allowed in the offices, classrooms, labs, and libraries where you need the continuous dimming between um, 115% and then um, shut off to 0%. A new addition um, or call out to this code are clear story um, window daylight zones. So windows that are up really high on a building. Um, this is showing how to calculate the daylight zone for a clear story window. So the lateral projection um, of the daylight zone is twice the um, depth of the clear story window. That's actually how um, big that window is itself, not not the floor to the bottom of it, just how how tall that window is. So twice that amount um, projected at a 45 degree angle um, from the center of the window to the floor. And then you project that up to see any light fixture that is within that daylight zone would need to be controlled. Um, <clears throat> and longitudinally, you would just go two feet on either side of that clear story window projected down on the ground. Um, other daylighting changes are uh, parking garage. Parking garages now have included daylighting zones. Anything, um, any fixture that is 20 feet from a wall that has 40% or more openings would need to um, follow daylighting requirements. And if you have a really small window um, where um, a really small
really small window with 10% um, of the calculated area. The, air, the size of the window is less than 10% of the uh, calculated daylight zone for that window, then you would not um, use that in the daylighting zone. It would not qualify as a daylighting zone. So if you have really tiny window, you don't want to, you might be able to calculate a large projection of daylight zone, but uh, the code wants to um, not have that happen. Top light zone changes so the rooftop mon rooftop monitors have been moved from uh, the side light section where windows are to top light zones um, and the way you calculate the i don't have a diagram here hopefully i'll add that later um, how you calculate the daylight zone for a rooftop monitor is um, laterally from the monitor you can go one uh, um, one time one times the height of the monitor from the floor up to the bottom of the monitor and horizontally um, a quarter of the height all around the monitor, um, the height from the floor to the bottom of the monitor. And if there's an obstacle in the way of where that daylight zone would project, um, if the obstacle is 70% uh, the height of the monitor, that's where the daylight zone would stop and um, drop down to the floor. Interior lighting power requirements. Um, dwelling and sleeping units are exempt from LPD requirements. Um, they have their own high efficacy uh, requirements. That's all you need to follow. You remove the floor area of all dwelling and sleeping units from your LPD uh, lighting power density calculation. Um, the total connected interior lighting power um, has been updated, equation 4.9. I'll go into that next. This is what um, these are the different values that would be included in your lighting power density calculation. So the total connected interior lighting power includes um, wattages from screw in lamps, uh, line voltage lamps, um, anything with ballasts um, included, LED lights, track lighting, and other luminaires. So I will go into some more details on this on the next slide. So the summary of that, of what you include in your lighting power density calculation, um, the changes for this code are track lighting. Um, you use the higher value of either the wattage, all, all the uh, lamps and fixtures that you're tying to your track system, the wattage of all those combined, or eight watts per linear foot of track length that will be installed um, because it's a flexible lighting pattern. So there's no saying you couldn't put more fixtures in later. Um, the old version of the code stated you needed to use 30 watts per linear foot for track lighting. So um, eight watts per linear foot um, seems to be a lot more, uh, more closely tied to LED lights that we're going to see installed in track lighting um, going forward. Um, or if you have, instead of doing all of that, if you have a current limiting device or um, even a breaker that's tied to the track lighting, you can use the maximum um, wattage that would be allowed by that current limiting device in your lighting power density calculation. Um, other areas not included in the lighting power density calculation are task lighting for plant growth and maintenance. This is new. Um, there's a limit to uh, how much uh, you can install there. It's uh, 75 watts per square foot of plant growth and maintenance area, um, including canopy area, but not hard surfaces that you would be doing work on. And there may be some more um, clarification on that in the final language of the code that I will be checking on. The interior lighting power density um, allowances are uh, for the building area method are on average 25% lower than what the um, 2015 energy code allowed. So I've just listed a few of the pretty common building types here, office, retail, warehouse, uh, manufacturing, healthcare, 
and bar or uh, dining. And on average, those are 25%, you know, they range, but about 25% lower than the current code. If you're looking at this space by space method, um, it is similarly about 25% reduction. If you average out all the different spaces um, with the 2015 version, I've again listed some of the more common space types here and um, they range uh, a bit more for each space based on how much is the reduction in lighting power is. Warehouses is pretty large at 40% reduction. Um, open and closed offices are 27, 28%. Conference rooms are right at 25% reduction. Corridors have not changed. Electrical mechanical rooms have decreased about 55%. Uh, high bay manufacturing down 39%. And restrooms 26 and lobbies only 16% reduction. Uh, additional interior lighting power. So there are uh, for retail areas. Um, this has been in the old code and the new code. Um, there are some, there's existing wattage that's allowed for sales areas. Um, it's equation 4-10, which I have listed up on the right in that box. Um, the base wattage of 250 watts here that is um, allowed has been reduced from 500 in the previous code. And all the different retail areas, uh, which are listed here, have an associated watts per square foot that you can um, add more wattage to based on the size of that retail area. And those watts per square foot have been reduced between 65 and 70% compared to the old code. So a uh, pretty big reduction there that is likely assuming all LED um, installations compared to the old code. So now, Moving on to exterior lighting, unless there's any questions on interior, that might be a good place to ask questions. All right, uh, exterior lighting, um, you start with, uh, you need to assign the exterior lighting zone that the project is occurring in. Um, for this code, zone four was removed entirely, uh, which is good because it never applied to Vermont. That's only the largest metropolitan areas, which Vermont does not have any of. Zone three is our um, our downtowns in Vermont, areas with the, the highest amount of exterior lighting. Um, zone two is the most common um, around Vermont, which is other villages, you know, mixed industrial and light commercial usages um, going on. And zone one, are pretty rural, um, undeveloped, you know, national or uh, national parks, state parks, and forest lands. Uh, some ski areas and their um, buildings um, are applicable to Zone One lighting requirements. So, with those zones, you've got um, different allowances for um, all the different exterior areas that will be illuminated. Um, first off, you start with the base site allowance of wattages for each zone, zone one, two, and three. And those are 50% lower than the previous version of the code. Then you can start looking at all these other areas um, that could be illuminated, parking areas and drives, walkways, stairs. Um, and those all have a watt per square foot or watt per linear foot um, allocation to them those amounts are 50% lower than the previous version of the code. There are also some new areas that have been added, including a dining area, exterior dining area, landscape area, and loading docks have been added to this version of the code, which is useful. And this is the rest of the um, exterior lighting um, table. So that is it for lighting. Um, there is a new um, requirement for electric vehicle charging stations. Um, the definition of EVSE, electric vehicle supply equipment, um, is what we're gonna what the code uses. So 
the code states that you must install electric vehicle supply equipment in 50% of the required spaces that we um, will be shown how to calculate on the next slide. Uh, you need to round up to the next whole number of what to install and then all the remaining ones that you don't actually install the charging equipment, you need to pre-wire them to be able to um, install the equipment in the future. All the parking spots um, must be labeled for EV use only that have these charging stations. And there are level one, two, and, um, and DC fast charging requirements for different building types. If you're only going to install level two or DC fast chargers, you would combine the um, number of charging stations you need um, for level one and two. Uh, just combine those together. So in the code, this is um, the new table showing how many parking spaces, how many charging stations, stations you would need based on the uh, size of your parking lot and occupancy type of your building. So I think the easiest way to go th through this, um, you know, up here you've got um, so any parking spot less than 25 spaces, um, you find your building occupancy here and the number of level one and level two or DC fast charge stations you would um, total you would need to have. Again, the code says you only need to install half of those and then pre-wire the remaining half. And that's also the case for if you're over 25 parking spaces um, in your lot, you've got two different options. So uh, an example I'm going to use is a hotel, which is group R1 um, with 100 parking spaces. So it, you've got two options here for over 25 parking spaces, A and B, group R1. Um, the first option you would... Um, Let's see here, you wouldn't you would not need any level one chargers, but you would need two percent of the spaces to have level two chargers. So uh two percent of a hundred is two total parking spots. Um the code says you only need to install half of those. So really you only need to install one when you construct the building and pre-wire the other level two uh charging station. If you follow option B. It says you need 1% of the parking spots to be level one, which 1% 1 of 100 is one level one parking spot and just 10 additional level two parking spots. Um, again, if you're going to install half of those, um, you would have to install the one level one charging spot and five of the level two uh, charging stations and pre-wire the remaining five level two spots for the future. So hopefully that makes a bit more sense. All right, that's it for the electric section of the code. Um, if there are no questions, I'm going to move on to section C406 additional efficiency package options. So the additional energy efficiency credits um, are, so there are six credits that are required for each new building. Um, there was, a, this section was in the old code, but has been expanded greatly for this, this code. And now it's a points-based system. Um, so you can kind of pick and choose what you would want to do for your building. Um, existing buildings do not need to meet uh, this any of these requirements if uh, there's modifications being made to them. Uh, tenant spaces, uh, build, buildings with those only need to meet um, three credits instead of the six. Um, you need to select a building occupancy type in all these tables. Um, if 65% or more of your building is in one of the listed uh, types here, R1, R2, B, E, or M, you would use those. If not, then there's a category for all other um, occupancy types. So I'll jump into that now. So the first credit 
that you could do is more efficient HVAC performance. So you would look at um, your different type of building here, R1, hotels, motels, R2, apartments and dorms, uh, B is businesses and offices, E is K through 12 education, M is uh, mer merchandise, and then you've got all other. And associated to those are the number of um, credits that you would get um, towards the six that you need to have total. And um, what you need to do to get those points for those different buildings is have 15%, at least 15% more efficient HVAC systems uh, based on the um, HVAC performance tables of the code. And 90% of your HVAC equipment must be listed in those tables um, that has actual efficiency values. And any standalone supply uh, return and exhaust fans over one horsepower need to have a fan efficiency grade of 71. Uh, the baseline is 70. So that's just a slight increase there. So that is the first credit option. The second is reduced um, lighting power. Uh, you've got two options here. So I've got two different tables. The first one is a 10% reduction in lighting power density values from the tables um, I showed earlier. Um, so those have some credits associated with them. And the second option is a 20% reduction in lighting power density values. And those have a uh, larger number of credits associated with them, depending on your building type. And d dwelling units must have 95% of their lamps and fixtures be high efficacy in any buildings to, uh, to get this credit. The third credit is enhanced um, lighting controls. So um, there's only certain, let's see, residential buildings are not applicable for this, um, just the other occupancy types. 90% of fixtures must have continuous dimming, individually addressable fixtures, daylight sensor controlling, uh, a daylight sensor controlling no more than eight uh, fixtures, digital a digital control system that reconfigures the light levels individually or a group of lights. You can do load shedding, individual occupant control in open offices, occupancy daylight sensor reconfiguration, and a sequence of operations that's outlined in the construction documents. So um, a networked lighting control would be um, a system that would meet these requirements here. Uh, the fourth credit is on-site renewable energy. So um, based on your, um, let's see, the size of your renewable energy system would need to be based on your conditioned floor area. Um, so you would look at the, uh, the building type um, that you have and multiply, um, if you're looking, looking for either the KV2 or kilowatt hours. This is just a conversion. It's the same value. So you can look at either one. Um, and so based on the floor area of your building, uh, you can find use this table to decide the size of your renewable energy system uh, to get your credits here. The different types of energy sources can be solar radiation, wind, waves, or tides, landfill gas or biogas, biomass, uh, wood is included, and geothermal heat. The fifth credit um, is dedicated outdoor air system. Uh, it needs to be 100% outdoor air system, uh, serving 90% of the conditioned floor area. You've got to follow ASHRAE 62.1 ventilation guidelines and have supply air temperature reset uh, based on the building loads or the outdoor air temperature. Uh, the sixth credit is high efficiency service water heating. So there are three options here. It's a little um, cluttered here, but the fir um, I will say that this is, let's see, none of these are applicable for businesses, education, or mercantile buildings, only uh, residential, R1, R2, and group I 
industrial buildings. So buildings that have higher um, hot water loads um, are even eligible for credit six. So the first option is uh, load fraction, where 60% of the hot water is provided by uh, waste heat recovery or renewable energy or a renewable energy heating system. So if you um, follow that, you can get these credits associated here. Option two is uh, high performance equipment. If all the heating equipment is 95% efficient or higher, uh, it's for, for fuel burning equipment, then you can get these credits here. And option three is, a, is heat pump equipment that um, has three uh, 3.0 coefficient of performance and you also must make sure you're not drawing the air for that heat pump uh, from the conditioned indoor space um, it's got to be uh, the only way you can do that is if it's exhausted air um, from the building credit seven is enhanced uh, envelope performance so if you've got um, there's a, a ua method um, listed in the code. If you do 15% better than that, you can um, get these credits associated here. The second option is uh, the above grade performance alternative where you um, your UA total um, of the envelope divided by the area um, is less than, must be less than or equal to 0 0.03. Um, and I did leave these out of the presentation, but those um, calculations are listed in, in the code language. Credit eight is reduced air infiltration. If you um, re get your air leakage down to 0.25 CFM 75 per square foot uh, from the 0.3, that is the baseline for the code, then you can get these credits listed here. Credit nine is efficient kitchen appliances. Um, a building has to have a commercial kitchen that serves at least five meals a week. And then all of this, if all of this equipment listed is Energy Star rated, then you can get the uh, credits listed here. And the last credit, credit 10, are controlled receptacles. So 50% of uh, plug-in receptacles in a building um, in offices, uh, conference rooms, classrooms, print and copy rooms um, must be controlled um, based on occupancy. And you can have either split receptacles where the top plug is controlled and the bottom is not, or um, separate receptacles where within 12 inches of each other, um, one's controlled and one is not. Uh, this is only applicable for um, occupancy types B and E, none of the others. Um, it's a 20 minute um, occupancy time delay um, that it's controlled and also um, time of day. So when the building is outside of occupied hours, um, those controlled receptacles would not have any power. Um, any equipment that needs to be, be on 24 seven is exempt from needing to be uh, plugged into those controlled receptacles. All right, any questions on those before I move on to the next section? Nope, all right, just keep moving. Uh, section C407 is uh, systems commissioning requirements. So the commissioning um, authority on a project must have experience with three previous projects that are uh, each at least 20,000 square feet. It needs to be a third party um, commissioning agent. Uh, so they can't be an employee of any of the teams listed here, design team, construction team, uh, the owner or developer. Uh, what buildings need to be commissioned? Uh, there's no longer a square footage requirement. Uh, for when a building needs to be commissioned, it used to be 50,000 square feet or larger. Um, now there are uh, size requirements um, that um, trigger when you need to commission your building um, for both um, mechanical systems and surface water systems. So 
uh, for a cooling water system um, or cooling system in general, uh, 480,000 BTU per hour or more, uh, you need to commission that. Or uh, space heating and service water heating combined capacity of 600,000 BTU per hour or more will require commissioning. Uh, requirements for commissioning, you got to have a commissioning plan, um, adjusting and balancing of the air and hydronic systems, functional performance testing of the HVAC equipment, um, controls and economizers, also the light fixtures and their controls. You need a commissioning report at the end, and uh, with that, some documentation, um, including the balancing report, uh, any construction drawings and notes on there, and an operation and maintenance uh, report as well. So on this is uh, the last portion, uh, last chapter of the code, existing buildings. Um, overall, there's no major changes, just some of the language has been reorganized. Um, I will call out what's the same as um, the 2015 code is for historic buildings. Um, historic buildings are exempt from repair alterations and change of occupancy code sections that I will go over. Um, if a historic building exemption report has been sent to and approved by the State Historic Preservation Office. That is the same requirement as in the current code. So additions to buildings, um, new, um, new and adjusted areas to mention are window and skylight areas. Um, additions need to meet all the fenestration requirements of the standard code. Um, an addition resulting in a total total building um, window and skylight area greater than code levels, um, you must comply with the uh, component performance alternative where you weigh out the different uh, portions of the envelope um, and the weighted average UA value of all envelope components. So if you if your addition increases the um, required number of windows you need, you've got to make up for it elsewhere. Alterations. Um, existing buildings cannot be less conforming to the code after their alteration. They must be the same, if not more. So that is basically the lesson to take out of this. Um, alterations, uh, you don't need to bring these. If you're just doing an alteration, you don't need to bring these areas up to code. That's if you're putting in storm windows, um, a film on single pane glass, if you're exposing any um, cavities in the ceiling, wall, or floor, as long as those are already filled with insulation. Um, if not, you need to fill them. Um, any existing cavities that are not exposed during your alteration. Um, a new um, alteration here is if you're replacing existing electric resistance units, um, that is allowed now. Um, any roof, roof recover and air barrier uh, for roof replacement, um, as long as the rest of the envelope is not touched. Those do not need to be brought up to code levels. Repairs. Um, these are repairs that do not need to meet code requirements. Glass only replacements, um, where you uh, leave the existing frame in place, roof repair, air barrier, um, roof repair, again, if the remainder of the envelope is not touched, um, vestibule on an existing door, as long as you're not uh, removing a vestibule that was there previously, you've got to keep it there, and bulb and ballast replacement um, if there's no increase in the lighting power density calculation. And change of occupancy or use. So if the change of occupancy or use of a building results in increased demand of either fuel or electric, then you are supposed to meet the commercial energy code requirements. Um, lighting uh, for a change of use should match the new occupancy type. Say you're changing from a warehouse to an office building, you should meet the new office uh, lighting power requirements. And um, if the change in building occupancy 
if the building being changed already exceeds the um, fenestration area requirements, then you don't need to meet those uh, in the change of occupancy. Um, you need to use the, uh, if you're using the component performance alternative, uh, the UA should be no greater than 100%, 110% of the targeted UA for fenestration. And that is it. Um, thank you all for attending or listening in after the fact. Um, I believe these slides will be available or we can make them available. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Well, well, thank you, Charlie. Uh, great job. And, and yes, uh, we have recorded this and uh, we'll be posting it online and we can certainly post the uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation along with the recording um, and appreciate the participation, uh, Cheryl and Jill. Um, and uh, we look forward to the next session. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Charlie. Yep. Yep. Thank thanks. you. Have a good one. Bye. 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 Yeah.